conclusion of John Glenn's second flight in space. I'm here with Walter Cronkite, and uh, as we watch, uh, let's look, take a look at the picture. There's our first pictures of the shuttle as we turn to NASA television, way off in the distance over central Florida, traveling at uh, great speed and uh, altitude at this point, but dropping very quickly. Walter, it, uh, take, you, take us back 36 years ago. The reentry was awfully different then, wasn't it? This is vastly different, watching an aircraft come in for a landing as opposed to watching a capsule plummet into the ocean under a, under a parachute, hopefully under a parachute. Now, every astronaut said that the greatest moment of the flight was when they saw that chute open above them after they'd come through the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, blackout period at that time. They landed by parachute in the ocean, out there in the ocean, recovery team on aircraft carrier destroyers. Everybody had their glasses focused on the sky, hoping for the first glimpse of the parachute. When they got it, there was a cheer, of course, that went up. Then the rush to get over to the uh, capsule. We'd lost one in the early stages with Grissom. Uh, his capsule uh, sank uh, under him. And there was always the fear that there might that might happen. Of course, there were all kinds of precautions taken against that. But uh, as long as they landed closely enough to the landing, to the recovery ships, why, all was well. And that happened in every case. All of those landings right up through Apollo from the return from the moon were the same type of very primitive landing compared to this aircraft type landing that the shuttle provides. And just, and also in the case of John Glenn, there was a lot of concern about that retro pack that he had still attached and whether his heat shield was properly attached. That was, uh, there were some tense moments, weren't there? Well, but that came before the landing sequence. That came in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the ionization as they entered the atmosphere. The determination was whether that heat shield was still on there, was being burned off as he went into the uh, intense heat of reentry. Uh, and that was a blackout period at that time. There was no communication. The ionization built up around the spacecraft so that there was no communication at all. And we went through a couple of minutes there of blackout, true blackout, in which no one here at the Space Center knew whether he'd successfully uh, re-entered the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere or not. Uh, by the time that communication was reestablished, it was known that indeed the heat shield had held as planned, that the retro package had burned off as planned, no problems. All right, and Commander Kurt Brown now guiding the Space Shuttle Discovery toward the 15,000-foot landing strip here at the Kennedy Space Center. Our Charles Zeewee is right beside that run runway. Charles? Miles and Walter, uh, as you say, about four minutes and 54 seconds now to touchdown. Everything in readiness here. The recovery crews on standby. You can see the runway all clear now. People waiting for that uh, sonic boom, the double sonic boom that signals the approach of the shuttle Discovery. John Glenn and crew arriving here. Uh, the emergency crews are ready to rush out onto the runway once the shuttle uh, touches down at about the 2,600-foot level along runway 33 here, the 15,000-foot runway, and makes its rollout and comes to a stop here. Uh, NASA told the crew just a short time ago they expect to touch down at about the 2,600-foot level all along the runway at about 205 knots as they make their approach again. They will not be using that drag chute here that had been some source of concern, albeit minor concern, by a everything in readiness for the shuttle everything looks good miles and Walter 200 205 knots about 225 miles an hour and I think as you just said that uh, we heard the loud report of a sonic boom Bob Cabana is sitting beside me commander of the next space shuttle mission STS 80 there, there we that go that was the sonic boom. those <laughs> were the sonic booms and uh, Bob take us aboard for a moment what's going on in the cockpit right now well right now Kurt and uh, Steve are totally focused on their task at hand following the guidance as he rolls on to the heading alignment cone here intercepting it at about 30 6,000 feet. He'll be flying a 270 degree turnaround to uh, final. Final approach is uh, a 20 degree dive at about 295 knots. So he's making sure he's monitoring his energy and that everything's on for uh, setting himself up for a good landing. And they've got the critical point right now of checking whether that parachute is going to deploy or not. The uh, the 11-foot uh, 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 door to the parachute canister fell off on launch. Uh, whether that thing deploys or not uh, is a concern. I gather, uh, Commander, that if it de deployed on the reducing speed for the final, that would be the most difficult situation. That's right, Walter. Uh, if it were to inadvertently deploy, uh, when they're down close to the ground would be the most critical time. But both uh, Steve and Kurt have been briefed ahead of time. They're prepared. 
and they'd be able to jettison it in a uh, moment's notice if that were the case. Do you consider those instructions to them that uh, the pilot's going to hit three buttons simultaneously? I don't know how he does that. <laughs> uh, to blow well, some explosive bolts and throw the thing out that, uh, that Kurt uh, Brown will let go for a moment, let it fly itself for a second or two, and then grab hold again. It, does, it, does that sound reasonable to you? Well, he's going to get them off real quick, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure Kurt is not going to totally let go during that time frame. <laughs> right. Now, as I understand it, Bob, the chase planes, which are giving the, us these pictures, are also uh, carefully looking at where that door would have been to see if they can ascertain anything about it. I, I suppose that'd be a difficult task to really learn much about what the shoot is doing right now. And that, that door is right back at the tail, so if it came out and we saw it on the film, on the picture here, it'd be right in the the after part of the aircraft, of course. We're about a minute 30 landing. Bob, what do you think about this shoot thing? Not a big deal as far as you're concerned? I don't think it's a big deal, Miles. Uh, I think they're going to do a nominal landing and everything's going to work just fine, uh, and they're well prepared for any eventuality. And I suppose it's worth pointing out to our viewers, the drag shoot is an add-on sort of midway through the shuttle program. Some 48 missions landed without them. It was an idea to save brakes and tires and so forth. It's not a mission-critical kind of thing, is it? You bet. And since then, we've even improved the brakes on the orbiter, so it uh, stops much better even without a shoot. Tell us about these crosswinds. The crosswind constraints are very, very strict here at NASA, 15 knots. Uh, being the limitations. I suppose the orbiter could probably, and certainly pilots such as yourself, could handle more. Uh, there, you always want to leave a little room for margin, Miles, and you don't want to push up right to the edge. So uh, we've expanded our envelope, and we've made it so that we can handle uh, whatever we have. All right, let's listen in as the shuttle comes down to the shuttle landing facility here at the Kennedy Space Center. Pilot Steve Lindsay is now armed the uh, landing gear. He's waiting to uh, just push that button to lower him at 300 feet. down and locked. Boy, from this angle, that doesn't look Main like 250 miles an hour, does it? No. Nice landing. There it's down. All right, Bob Cabana said it. That's the uh, more than layperson's view of it. A nice landing. What are you looking for there? Uh, you're looking for uh, a nice, smooth touchdown, uh, steady control, hitting your target point on the runway, being on airspeed, and uh, keeping it tracking straight down the runway. And Kirk did a fine job, as I would have expected. How about this? A perfect flight from absolute launch to, to set down. Not, not a scarcely a glitch. The parachute is the only one that could be considered a glitch and is, as you said, Commander, that it wasn't critical. Well, Walter, we've come a, a long way since uh, Senator Glenn's first flight and uh, this is quite a spaceship that we're flying now. It sure is. Tell us what happens next, Bob. They don't just hop right out uh, as you do when a commercial airliner gets up to the jetway. There's a lot that needs to be done right now, right? You bet. First off... Have uh, you been on a commercial shuttle flight lately? You don't, <laughs> you, you don't hop right out of those either. You, you might as well have a medical experiment <laughs> well, uh, first thing you're going to do, Miles, is start uh, making sure that the orbiter itself is safe, sniffing around for any uh, hypergolic, any fuel, anything that might be leaking, and uh, on board, they're safing the systems. So there's a fair number of switches to be thrown, even as it sits e there on the runway? Even after landing. And when you say these hypergolic uh, gases, we're talking about the gases which control the thrusters in orbit, right? The thrusters for the Ohm's engines, the orbital maneuvering system engines, the reaction control system jets that control us. Give us a sense of the emotions inside right now. There's oh. some high fives being exchanged oh, right now. I'll I tell you, my first orbital landing, I was just so proud. I had, at the end of it, I had tears coming down my eyes. I was so proud of the crew and what a fine job they'd done and uh, so happy to be on the Earth after a safe, successful mission. It, it, one of the, next to the birth of my children and getting married, it was the high point of my life. It was outstanding. They didn't stow away a little champagne that they're uncorking right <laughs> no, now. No, unfortunately, we haven't got that far yet in uh, space travel. Not like a balloon flight. <laughs> right. The, uh, uh, the, I, I gather that there are 20 or 30 vehicles involved in this, uh, this post-landing procedure. 1,200 people or so involved. It's an army. And they, uh, they only approach within about 1,200 feet of the vehicle from the rear checking these gases before they move closer into the and uh, attach the umbilicals piping some clean air in there. 
Yes, sir. They'll, they'll be doing some sniffing with uh, equipment to make sure it's a safe environment before people actually go in there. Right. It may be an hour before the, uh, the crew comes out, is that correct? Uh, the crew will come out uh, sooner than that. Uh, before we actually see them will be a while. They'll be getting on the uh, crew transport vehicle, and uh, they have a number of uh, medical tests and uh, programs that they have to go through before they're released. So it's going to be a while before we actually see the crew. Tell us a little bit about the training, uh, Bob, because... Um, you know, even the most veteran of shuttle pilots or commanders get six landings maximum, real real ones. You've had uh, three opportunities. Um, I'm curious if the simulators that you work with do, do the job uh, properly. The, the simulators are excellent. Uh, in Houston, the shuttle mission simulator, we simulate everything from launch down over ops to landing many times over. But the, the real key for landing the space shuttle is the shuttle training aircraft. And uh, it's, uh, it's a real airplane flying in a real environment, and it flies uh, just like the space shuttle. The first time I landed Columbia, uh, I felt like I'd done it a thousand times before, and I had in the shuttle training aircraft.